Hello! Happy Hanukkah! That's a Mia! Hello, hello! Welcome, welcome! It is the beginning of the Festival of Lights! Don't worry if you're not Jewish! You're welcome to come celebrate with me, okay? I give you all gifts! I give you all gifts! There is actually a special message for everyone here who's celebrating Hanukkah from the amazing, the never inappropriate Kamala Harris, who's recently been in the news for buying a $500 pot. Hey everybody, we're here to talk about one of our favorite holidays in our big modern family. Hanukkah. And why do you love Hanukkah? I love Hanukkah because it really is about... <laughs> that is the face. <laughs> Every kid makes when you're asked a question and you like legit do not know the answer. Well, well, uh, my, um, I really like. It really is about the light and bringing. <laughs> Thank you, Kamala Harris. Hanukkah is about the light. Light where there has been darkness and there is so much work to be done in the world to bring light. And it is... <laughs> that is, like, the most cop-out answer ever, right? Like, all these fucking holidays, I just said it, all these holidays are about bringing light. Like, like Christmas is about bringing light. Diwali is about bringing light. Like, they're all about bringing light. You know why she doesn't want to say it, right? Is that Hanukkah is literally about a fucking revolt. All the lefty Jews in chat, today is the only day that you could think about a revolution. And I'm not talking Bernie Sanders style. I am once again asking for your financial support. It's a celebration of always Tikkun Alam, which is about fighting for justice and, and fighting for the dignity of all people. And it's about redid- No, that's not what Hanukkah's about. I don't hate Kamala Harris. I actually like Kamala Harris. I just think this video is so fucking cringy. Dedication. And it's about joy. And it's about joy. And it's about spreading joy around the world and sharing it with your family and your friends and your neighbors and your community. That's important right now. So that's what we are doing is to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah. I hate the piano in the background. to your family from ours, we wish you all the best. Should we light the candle? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. They're lighting the candle. Is she gonna do it the right way? Yeah, she's lighting the shamash first. Okay. This kind of looks like a hostage video. Yeah, it does. You know why? You know what's behind Kamala Harris, right? It's the Mossad. It's the same people that control me. Anyways, we're gonna learn a little bit about like the actual historical event that Hanukkah is based on. Because there's like, if you know, if you wanna know, Basically, the, the grand scheme of, like, Jewish, uh, Jewish holidays is most of them have the same story. Someone tried to kill us. We almost died. We somehow survived. This is, like, a long tradition. So, um, Hanukkah is kind of a similar story. I think the only difference is, like, Jews have a little more self-determination in this story, um, which I think makes a lot of Jews prefer it because Jews literally, like, revolt when, you know, historically we've been kind of somewhat pacifist, right? So we'll kind of get into it. It's kind of, I, I, hopefully they'll start with like, you know, how the areas started getting taken over, you know, the effects of Alexander the Great and all that stuff. So we'll see. Jewish communities across the globe come together in celebration God, of the, the festival of Hanukkah. The image of the menorah and its iconic eight candles shining through the dark winter night is one of the most visually recognizable aspects of traditional Jewish culture. But from where Korea, does this I'd ancient to holiday too, ritual stem? A partnership agreement. To answer, we must go back 2,200 years to a time when the descendants of Alexander the Great ruled in the land of Judea, and tell a story of the ancient Jewish people's struggle to win liberty against the forces of the Hellenic. Wait, is he saying that the Jews were in Judea? I thought the Jews were all from Europe and they were European colonizers. I didn't know that the Jews were actually in Judea, that's crazy. World. Our sponsors allow us to release videos you know, regularly without through. missing a beat, so shout out to Supremacy1914 for sponsoring this video. 
Supremacy 1914 is a free online PvP strategy game. Uh, These epic battles okay. in the description to get days, so don't wait. Click the link. Independent oh God, kingdoms so of Israel and Judah for the first details will be shared at the end of the video. By the era of classical antiquity, the independent kingdoms of Israel and Judah were in terminal decline. As a result, the history of the- Is that- I know that sounds really- that probably seems really confusing to some people. Like, you're probably wondering, why is there an Israel and why is there a Judah, right? Um, like Judea. That's like- that's super weird, right? I thought Judea was Israel. Well, originally it was. Originally it was like one Israel. Um, but as we know that the- the tribes of the Israelites are made up of, of 12 tribes. One of those tribes is called Judah. Um, Judah is actually a very famous tribe. It was known as the King's tribe because that's where King David came from um, and King Solomon, etc. Um, and also Jesus Christ was said to be descended from the King's tribe, Judah. But Judah and I, I forget which other tribes, but and like two other tribes end up like something like that. They end up revolting. Uh, they end up having basically like a civil war and the nation gets divided into two. And so because Judas like led that rebellion and, and led that um, that fight, they name their section of the of the state Judea um, after Judah and Israel still stays Israel at the north, right? The Jewish people soon came to be defined by the carousel of foreign empires that took turns conquering and subsequently. Oh, no. So Judas is a totally different character. Judas is not Judah. I know it's very confusing, right? But Judah, it's like J-U-D-A-H, right? It's Judah. Um, Judas is the, is the guy that comes much later that supposedly betrays Judas. Subsequently Jesus. ruling the ancestral Hebrew homeland. First came the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, who ruled the Jews with a reasonably fair and light hand. Finally, in 332 BC, the Macedonian phalanxes of Alexander would steamroll the Achaemenid Empire out of existence, establishing classical Greek as the dominant language and culture of the Near East. It is here that the Jewish people became subjects of the Greek world. When Alexander died... Yep, that's where the term Jew comes from. Exactly, right? A lot of actually... There's a lot of people who don't like the term Jew right, or Jewish and stuff, um, they prefer to call themselves to this day still like Israelites. So, but yeah, that's where the, that's where the term comes from because of the split in the split in the nations. It's actually really fascinating because there are certain tribes that end up being descended from the, the Northern Israelites that don't actually refer to themselves as being Jewish, like the, the term Jewish, even though they have all the same traditions, um, they call themselves Israelites. His massive Macedonian empire fractured into several monarchies, ruled by his closest comrades and later their descendants. The so-called Diadochi kingdoms were constantly at war with one another. Super fascinating stuff, right? This is one of the reasons why empires suck. I mean, okay, I like empires, right? But like practically they cause a lot of problems. Even if you look at the south, uh, if you look at Egypt right over here, um, the uh, Ptolemy the first, his descendants end up basically pushing Egypt into like the gutter, right? Like e ancient Egypt becomes like just really it loses its golden age and eventually ends with, of course, the infamous or famous reign of Cleopatra um, when she finally got defeated by uh, by uh, Augustus or Octavius. He was o Octavius at the time, I think, um, of Rome. You know, Cleopatra, Mark Antony, the whole shebang. But yeah, she's a, a descendant of uh, Ptolemy, just so you can kind of get see how everything's connected and of course right here is where we, we've got israel right this is where jerusalem is this is where judah was and this is where israel was and the region of judea thank being you, situated you, in the borderland between the ptolemies of egypt and seleucids of syria became a battleground where the two macedonian dynasties jockeyed for power and influence despite this life remained fairly peaceful for the hebrews the Hellenistic kings generally used the same light touch the Persians had, interfering very little in the region's culture, religion, and internal politics. The Jewish people were- The Persians actually had a really positive reputation with Jews. There were like a few hiccups here and there, but largely um, Jews felt like they could practice their religion and they still felt like they were treated um, quite fairly like in the, in the region.
were ruled semi-autonomously by a high priest of the Judaic faith, who handled matters both religious and secular from the Great Temple of Jerusalem. In 198 BC, Antiochus oh, III so what, had finally expelled the Ptolemies out of yep, Judea, the putting the region firmly under the suzerainty of the Seleucid Empire. He lowered taxes and affirmed the Jewish people's freedom to live by their own faith and laws, and for now, Judea was con- Yo, Antiochus, thank you so much. What a chad. What a chad this guy is. You know, religious freedom. It's like, sounds like a fucking lib, man. Tent. You know? Throughout world history, we often see subject peoples of a multi-ethnic empire willingly adopt the language and customs of said empire's rulers oh, cool, in an Zanya attempt to improve social mobility. So many Jewish peoples began to practice the Greek culture of their suzerains. This phenomenon, known as Hellenization, was perpetuated mainly by the upper strata of Jewish society. This is a common thing. Honestly, throughout Jewish history of Jews being in the diaspora. Diaspora means a Jews who are living outside of Israel because the attitude is that you're not home. And so it's really interesting is that like, like a, there's another term, uh, I guess a more modern term to describe this phenomenon is called assimilation. And it's a problem if anyone here comes from, has been a minority right, from like a specific culture, whether you're a Muslim living in the United States or you're, um, uh, you practice Jainism and you live in, in the UK or something like that, or you're a Drew um, and you live in Syria, any of those instances, there's gonna be all these like forces kind of pushing you to assimilate within the culture. Um, and of course the same things, w and because Jews were almost always minorities wherever they went, there were, they were always under this intense pressure to assimilate. Oh my God, I said Drew. I meant, I meant Drews. <laughs> okay. Um, anyways, it's interesting because the story, like a huge part of the story is like the, um, idea of like the assimilated Jew. And it's interesting because I'm pretty, I, like, I mean, I would probably be considered a pretty assimilated Jew. Not compared to some Jews, <laughs> but I would be considered pretty assimilated um, because I don't practice a lot of the particularly religious aspects, um, traditional aspects of, of the religion, right? This is something that goes on. And the people who tend to assimilate, like just, I, I don't even know if I want to say statistically because like, I don't know if I've seen stats, but this is just like, a, it's a truism, I guess, that's known is that the people who tend to assimilate tend to be the higher classes of Jews, right? Higher economic classes. I don't mean higher moral classes, okay? And this tends, I'm sure it probably is the same for almost any other culture, that the more educated you are, the more um, interconnected you are with like the other non-Jewish society that you're around, the more likely that you're going to start becoming more and more like them, dressing like them, marrying into them, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's considered a very dangerous thing in Judaism because there's this fear of being kind of like bred out or right or like completely losing your culture. Um, this is a, a fear of a lot of other like, you know, indigenous groups or anything like that. So would you say you're culturally Jewish? Yeah. Yeah, I would say I'm culturally Jewish. Um, I would say in general, I, I still consider myself Jewish because to me, being Jewish is about my ethnicity and my ancestry um, more than anything. Um, it's not necessarily just a, a religion to me. I converted to Judaism. Oh my God, I'm never gonna live that one down. But anyways, the story kind of features that like that there are these, you know, higher class Jews that have, you know, assimilated, right? Into, and it's called Hellenization, right? Into like the culture. So they're kind of dressing like them. They're practicing like them. They're, they're still Jews, but they're not, they're just kind of assimilated. And there's a lot of resentment that comes, uh, uh, comes with that, right? And there's naturally, like with anything, there's privileges that come along with being assimilated versus not being assimilated. I mean, being Jewish is such a good example because you can be very much more visually Jewish and, you know, wearing a, a kippah or like that head cap versus being able, some people can just completely assimilate into like white Christian culture by not wearing that. Um, so they're going to be subjected to less anti-Semitism, for example. So resentment often kind of fosters as a consequence of that. It's just fascinating. And even if you're not Jewish, you could probably like totally understand. It's very similar, I think, to some of the resentment, like darker um, people who are black, uh, people who are black, who have darker skin, 
um, have towards people who are black who have lighter skin who can often assimilate more into whiteness. It's a kind of similar kind of attitude. Namely, the wealthy priests, merchants, and aristocrats in urban Jerusalem. Are there any other Jerusalem. descriptors like Jewish that can the be used to describe both? The Hellenization process was expedited in one seven. I think I would say, like, any, honestly, any kind of like indigenous tribe, like Mohawk, something like that, or like the Roma, something like that's probably all similar. BC. When the culturally traditionalist high priest, Anias III, was deposed by his Philhellene brother, Joshua, better known by his Greek name, Jason. Jason would go on to wield his that power as Jason. high priest to begin transforming Jerusalem into a classically Greek city by building a gymnasium and an ephebium, essentially community centers for- You're building a gym? No, that is not happening. There is nothing Jews hate more than exercise, okay? For Greek education and learning. I'm he kidding, also I'm sure sent Jewish to athletes to compete in a mimicry of the Olympic Games hosted by the king in Tyre. There he offered a sacrificial tribute to the Greek demigod Hercules, to whom the games were dedicated. Ooh, that's Perhaps bad. his most that's radical bad. policy was to allow non-Jews in Jerusalem to set idols of their gods within the holy temple itself. The fact that the high priest was openly tolerating and even promoting the polytheistic gods was deeply disturbing to many Jews. Yeah, and he probably felt like a puppet, a puppet priest, you know? Who clung to their monotheist faith. This sentiment was especially strong in the poorer rural communities of Judea, who had clung far closer to Orthodox Judaism. Did you guys a strange situation was made worse in 175 BC when one Antiochus IV Epiphanes became the Seleucid Basileus. Various ancient accounts describe him as a proto-Nero or Commodus, that is to say, erratic. He yeah, Nero and Commodus were both Roman emperors, and they're both considered traditionally, they're considered like the worst emperors that Rome ever had. So if you get compared to like a Commodus or a Nero, like if like a girl, if you're ever having sex with a girl and she just stops, she's like, oh my God, you're totally being a Commodus right now. That's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. She's comparing you to a shit emperor. His sobriquet, Epiphanes, meant manifested from God, but among his people, he was secretly known by a variation of the title, Epimanes, which meant madman. It was him who in the first year of his rule, I mean, there's no issue with having multiple gods in theory, right? Like from our perspective here. But if you're a culture that's very monotheistic and the, the core tenant of Judaism is believing only in one god for them, you can understand why they would feel like their culture is being eroded and stolen from them. ...reported Jason's coup against Anias III, hoping a pro-Greek high priest would help Hellenize the Jews. However, only three years later, Antiochus decided that Jason wasn't Hellenizing Judea fast enough, so helped replace him with an even more pro-Hellenic priest, Menelaus. With that matter settled, Antiochus then marched with his armies into Egypt, aiming to double the size oh of his god. empire I'm by seizing the Ptolemaic heartland. What if she calls me Caligula? <laughs> oh my god, that's an awkward one. While the king was preoccupied, Jason seized his opportunity and returned to Jerusalem, initiating a counter-coup and expelling the deeply unpopular Menelaus. However, Antiochus's campaign was cut short when the Roman Republic intervened on behalf of the Ptolemies. Unable to match the strength of the legion, the king was forced to retreat to Syria. Already utterly humiliated by Rome, Antiochus- Just remember, this is the Roman Republic. We're not talking about the empire. This is back when the Roman Republic was often trying to help the, um, uh, the Telemic kingdom for a while, right? Um, that's why they even eventually allied with, um, with Cleopatra temporarily. And then that kind of is a mixed story. <laughs> the later ends up happening. His mood turned wrathful. But yeah, the, right now, this is what they mentioned was the Roman, Roman Republic, not the Empire. A lot of people get confused. There's three periods of Roman history, of ancient Roman history. There's the Roman Kingdom, which almost no one talks about because Rome was kind of, kind of inconsequential at the time, and it was uh, an elected kingdom. Then there was the Roman Republic, which is what they're discussing. Think Julius Caesar, think Cicero, etc. Right? I think we have a Cicero in chat. <laughs> and then, of, of course, with Octavian, who is the so-called heir of, of Caesar, I think he was like the adopted nephew or something, right? He becomes Augustus and he and launches like the first empire of Rome. When he found out that his subjects in Jerusalem had rebelled, he stormed Jerusalem with his army, 
slaying the supporters of Jason and reinstating his puppet Menelaus as high priest. He then left Apollonius in charge of subduing the city, who accomplished his job by dismantling the walls of Jerusalem and building a fort named Acre on the nearby hill of Ophel so everyone could gaze upwards and see the symbol of King Antiochus's power. Rather than leaving good enough alone, Antiochus began to actively exterminate Judaism, forbidding the people of Judea from observing the Sabbath, circumcising their sons, or performing other rituals. He oh no! You know, you can prevent Jews from performing the circumcision, right? You know, but I mean, there's probably some good ethical arguments there. But you did not take away their day of rest. Because as I mentioned, Jews do not like exercise. And Saturday, the Sabbath, that is the day that they 100% do not have to exercise. He had the holy temple in Jerusalem converted into a temple of Zeus, within oh, which- Oh shit, that is, a, that is a huge fucking burn. He personally spilled the blood of a pig, a deeply sacrilegious ritual to the Judaic faith. The king declared that the Jewish people should begin Yo, worshiping the Greek dick gods. Move. Hellenized Jews accepted these changes, but many others did not, resolving instead to fight. It is here that the Maccabees enter our story. If you were a Jew at the time, right, would would you have accepted the changes and be like, well, bro, I guess we lost. I guess it's a done deal. Or do you think you would have been like, no, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to fight for my culture. Like, what would you do? To be honest, I feel like I would have just joined the Hellenistic Jews. I would be like, well, they've got good robes, guys. Sorry. Our story now shifts to the small Judean town of Modin, where a local priest, Mattathias, and his five Zeus sons live. Fuck. Yeah, he literally they is the original to the alpha, relatively so minor Hasmonean family, and were deeply orthodox Jews, who had remained true to every tenet of their religion, even as their countrymen became increasingly assimilated into Greek culture. Sometime in 167 BC, a Seleucid official arrived in Modin and compelled the townsfolk to offer a sacrifice to the Greek gods. Mattathias refused to make this offering, and another one of the townsfolk, a Hellenized Jew, stepped forth to do so in his place. Flying into a rage, Mattathias drew his knife and murdered his countrymen before he could perform the ritual. The priest then cut down the Seleucid- What a chad! Sounds like a great guy. What a chad! official as well, and destroyed the pagan altar for good measure. Knowing they would be branded outlaws, Mattathias and his five sons fled into the nearby hills, followed by many like-minded Orthodox Jews known as the Hasidim. From there, the fight had begun. While Mattathias died sometime in 166 BC from causes unknown, he would be succeeded by his third son Judah, a dynamic young commander who through a mixture of ferocity, ruth- Again, different Judah. There's a lot of Jews named Judah, okay? ...lessness and Jews. bravery would come to be known as Maccabeus, a word deriving from the Aramaic Maccaba, the hammer. At the early stage- Otherwise known as the Maccabees. Have you ever heard of like the Maccabees, like Judah the Maccabee? Right, like that's where it comes from, right? Literally called the hammer. It's kind of kind of a badass name, I'm not gonna lie. Ages, the rebellion was not a struggle between Jews and Greeks, but a civil conflict between pro- and anti-Hellenic wow, Jews. Of the Maccabees <laughs> began their movement with a terror campaign, launching lightning raids upon predominantly Jewish towns. They killed many of their own countrymen, who they considered too Greek, burning down their homes and destroying the pagan altars where they worshipped. Most notably, they rounded up the sons of Fuck, I feel like I might have gone and killed during Kanika. Why am I celebrating this? Anyways, let's continue. Hellenized Jews and had them forcefully circumcised. The <laughs> Holy shit. This is not the shit I learned in school. You know what? It's funny, like, when, like, you're learning, like, Judaism's so weird because there's historic, there's, like, the actual history of Jews, and... Like, and sometimes it overlaps with the religion. It often does. But then there are things that they leave out when you're getting taught as a kid, right? Like when they teach you the story of Esther, for example, they leave out the fact that like the queen who gets killed, they leave out that she was like forcibly, she was refusing to be forcibly raped. Shit like that. 
Um, and even here, like they kind of, I remember in school, like they kind of left out like the fact that they just like wiped out and killed all the, um, the Hellenistic Jews because they weren't Jewish enough. Like this kind of sounds like, um, like radical Judaism. <laughs> Is that a term? No, I'm meant to hear right now. It sounds like a little scary. Message was simple. Greek culture. Like they like for, do four circumcisions. That's so fucked up. Was to be purged from Judea. Before long, the Maccabees had earned the attention of the military governor Apollonius, who resolved to crush the rebels before they could sow any more chaos. In 167 BC, after gathering a local army of around 2,000 yeah, men in Samaria, Apollonius marched south to the Gophna Hills, where it was said oh that God, the elusive that. Judah was hiding out. Here, the Maccabees proved they were capable of more than just murdering civilians and burning altars. Knowing they were outnumbered and out-equipped, Judah deliberately lured the enemy army deep into his native territory, where the hilly terrain made it impossible for the Seleucids to form up into their Macedonian phalanx. With only 600 men, the Pro Maccabees strategy, surrounded and ambushed the Seleucid forces just outside the town of Wadi Haramea, routing them off the field. Apollonius was killed in the fighting, and Judah claimed the- Yeah, I don't think they were really thinking about optics at the time. ...fallen commander's sword, wielding it as a symbol that his rebellion had been blessed by God. The Maccabees followed up their victory with another in 166 BC, ambushing an army of 4,000 Seleucids led by Seron at the Beth Horon mountain pass. These two victories would set the theme for much of the revolt, in which smaller, poorly armed contingents of Maccabian warriors would oh utilize terrain-based guerrilla warfare to consistently outwit the well-armed Seleucids. Eris, what does the term Zionist mean? I've heard it thrown around, but I don't know. Honestly, it has so many meanings. I actually have a whole video on the various meanings of Zionism and discussing whether or not I could be considered a Zionist. I do think, though, when the majority of people who call me a Zionist, I think they're doing it w with for anti-Semitic purposes um, because it's often used as an anti-Semitic dog whistle. But anyways, I don't want to talk about Israel shit to God knows. Okay, let's talk about fucking history. Lucid armies that outnumbered them greatly. Later that year, Antiochus IV was forced to take the bulk of his armies eastwards to deal with a Parthian invasion, putting the local governor of Syria, Lysias, in charge of quashing the growing Jewish revolt with limited resources. Despite this, no, Lysias okay, managed to field a significantly large army of some 10,000 professional Macedonian trained soldiers. He put two experienced commanders, Gorgias and Nicator, in charge of this force and sent it into Judea. The Hellenes set up an entrenched camp at the town of Emmaus, while Maccabeus responded by leading around 3,000 Jewish warriors to the adjacent town of Mizpah, where they fasted and prayed to God to deliver them victory in the battle to come. I feel like fasting before like a massive military conquest is like a bad idea. I don't know. I Sometimes there's some practices that we Jews do that like, like we love fasting. It's so stupid. I'm sorry. If uh, there's a rabbi watching, please don't be offended. Come. In the days that followed, some of the local anti maccabean Jews yeah, at least take informed your the shit. Seleucid commanders where Judah had set up his base. Like, they're fasting, they don't like the gym. Like, it's honestly a fucking miracle. Of course it's a fucking miracle they end up winning. Like, holy shit. Seizing the opportunity to catch his enemy flat-footed, Gorgias rallied some 5,000 inf- Maybe that's how he said- Okay, maybe that's how Judah and the Maccabee, like, incentivize the other Maccabees, right? He's like, bro, like, there's food there. There's food, we can go for it. Infantry ...and 1,000 cavalry and march for Mizpah. However, his heavily armored Argyraspides were slow and cumbersome, and their presence was soon picked up on by Maccabean scouts. Rather than face Gorgias' force head-on, Judah decided, rather ingeniously, to abandon his camp, taking advantage of his army's speed and maneuverability to skirt around the expeditionary force and strike instead at their now more oh, sparsely shit. populated camp at Emmaus. Taken completely by That's surprise, as fuck. the reserve forces in Emmaus were- They were fast because they were so late. They were either hungry. slaughtered or routed, and their supplies looted or burned. After failing to find any rebels in Mizpah or the surrounding hinterlands, 
Gorgios returned to his camp, only to find it like, aflame. Goddamn. Seeing this, the morale of his Fucking army Jews. was crushed Jews, and man. they fled for the coast. Reeling from yet another decisive defeat, the high priest Menelaus in Jerusalem, oh, with man, the support of Lysias, like... attempted to bring Judah and his cohort to the bargaining table, offering to repeal some of the more egregious anti-Judaism <laughs> laws of Antiochus. However, these negotiations failed, for the Maccabees would accept nothing less than the total eradication of Hellenization in Judea. By 164 BC, Swifty, Governor Lysias had taken it upon himself no, to Ryan, assemble and will be lead an army of some 20,000 men in Antioch, leading them history. south Perfect. through Idumea and the valleys east of Gaza to a town called Beth Zer, where he encamped his army in the local fortified citadel, hoping to strike at the Maccabees' southern flank. By this point, Judah Maccabeus had some 10,000 men under you know, his I'm command, his numbers having people, swelled as the reputation out. of his victories grew. Nevertheless, he was still outnumbered Who and outgunned by Lysias' army, so he stuck to tried and true tested methods to best his foe. Historical sources are vague on how the Battle of Beth Zer played out, but it seems evident that the Maccabees spent the next few months harassing the Seleucids through hit-and-run tactics. Striking I remember learning about this in school. Like, um, what we learned is that they actually, they did these really cool, like, guerrilla tactics where they would bang pots and things like that and make it sound like they had, like, very severe weaponry when they didn't. Cool stuff, cool stuff. ...at foraging parties, patrols, and any platoon of Syrian Greeks unfortunate enough to be caught outside the town citadel. This was never enough to earn a decisive victory, but it was enough to keep Lysias and his army consistently on the back foot. Imagine the status quo changed in late autumn like I'm hearing some when metal in the Far clashing. East, the Seleucid Epiphanes contracted disease while campaigning against the Parthians and died. The monarch's death meant that his son, the 10-year-old Antiochus V, was now Basileus of the Seleucid Empire and there would be no small amount of courtiers willing to influence the young boy for personal gain. Suddenly, Lysias- Wow, that's never happened in the history. Never happened in the history of monarchy, where, like, a child inherits a throne and it causes a ma massive power vacuum where everyone's vying for influence? Yes, never happened, never happened. ...he's had shifted, and he was compelled to return to Antioch to secure control of the infant king in order to keep his power and influence in the royal court which meant that the campaign in Judea was over. Due to his persistence, cunning, and some plain old luck, Judea Maccabeus was victorious once more. With his victory at Beth Zer, he was able to march his army more or less unopposed to Jerusalem, which, ironically, he was able to stride right into because the Seleucid governor Apollonius had destroyed its city walls a few years earlier. Following this, the Hellenized and other Seleucid loyalists retreated to Acre. Now firmly in control Where of the holy city, the hammer of Judea entered the temple, destroying the altar to Zeus and the idols that had been erected during the reigns oh. of Jason and Menelaus. His youngest brother, so when does Jonathan the genocide Apphus, start? That's was installed as the new oh high priest god. of Judea. Oh my god. Among the sacred objects to be restored was the menorah, a golden candelabrum whose seven branches represented knowledge and creation. It was supposed to be kept burning every night, but its light had been extinguished during the persecutions. However, the temple had been so thoroughly pillaged that there was only enough oil to keep the candles of the menorah burning for one night. Despite this, once lit, the candles burned bright and true for eight full days. This supposed miracle of God is the cornerstone of that's the that's considered the miracle of Hanukkah. It's like that after this victory, there is only this amount of oil to you know to light it for just one night, but it somehow lasts eight nights. Doesn't sound like a big deal. It's probably not that big of a deal, but it's a nice idea, right? Hanukkah, and to this day, when Jewish communities around the world light eight candles on their menorahs, they commemorate each day. So that's why technically. When you see a, okay, so when you see here, this is just like a little lesson, like this is not tech, even though I've been calling in this a menorah, it's not technically a menorah. Um, it's actually called a Hanukkah. And that's because a menorah 
here. A classic menorah is like this, um, where all of like the candles are the exact same height and there's seven. So there's three on one side, three on the other side, one in the middle, and they're all the same height. And it's supposed to represent the seven days of the week or like the seven days that it took God to create the world. Uh, and that's what is a men that's what a menorah is. And it's a little different than what a Hanukkah is. So Hanukkah is a little different because it's got the it's got eight and then it's got the center shamash, you know, the thing that I was proudest moment of my life. And it's much taller, a L- little bit different, a little bit different. That's why, like, sometimes you saw some of the Jews and other Jews in chat were like, hey, it's not technically a menorah, it's a Hanukkah. It's like, bro, OK, I know. Do they make candles that burn slowly to simulate that? Assuming the candles were blown out. Um, no. In fact, Hanukkah candles are really shit, okay? They're cheap-ass, annoying fucking things that, like, tend to melt and burn your hand. Please, rabbinical shamash meme? Okay. Me, raise his hand in Torah study? Yeah. Uh, would using the Hanukkah candles in BDSM sex play render them tray for would it be a mitzvah? I age greatly every time you speak. <laughs> oh, my God. Honestly, they probably would be better for BDSM sex. Because they melt all the time. They always burn you. First time viewer. What's fascinating is that the story about the oil did not arise until hundreds of years later. After the episode, there's no mention of the supposed miracle documenting the Maccabees. Wow, I didn't even know that, Immoculus. That's really interesting. I'm not surprised. It's interesting. I love, like, seeing how traditions develop and add on and, and like, and grow. It's, it's really, really cool. And you often see, like, I, Judaism, even though it's so focused on not being assimilated into other cultures, they actually do borrow from a lot of other cultures, like, a lot. I mean, even the concept of kings. Um, Judaism didn't believe in the concept of kings, and it was, and Jews were like, hey, but everyone else gets a king. Like, we kind of want one, too, because monarchy sounds base. Like, I don't know, this whole complex judge system we have with elders is, like, kind of annoying. We want a king. And so then God's like, fine, bro, we'll give you a king. Anyways, I'll put on the video again. Presented knowledge and creation. It was supposed to be kept burning every night, but its light had been extinguished during the persecutions. However, the temple had been so thoroughly pillaged that there was only enough oil to keep the candles of the menorah burning for one night. God decreed Despite judges this, are now cringe. Once lit, the candles burned bright and true for eight full days. This supposed miracle oh of God, God so is the cornerstone of Hanukkah, and to this day, when Jewish communities around the world light eight candles on their menorahs, they commemorate each day the light burned for Judea Maccabeus and his freedom fighters. Jerusalem may have been taken, but the war was far from over. Seeking to keep his momentum, Judea besieged Acre in early 162 BC. He expected that Lysias, still locking horns with his political rivals in Antioch, would not bother sending a force to relieve the siege. He was wrong, and in a surprise to everyone, Lysias left Antioch with an army of some 50,000 infantry, 500 cavalry, and at least 30 war elephants. Maccabeus had a respectable 20,000 warriors loyal to him, so upon hearing this news, he broke the siege of Acre and marched southwards, meeting his foe on the hills outside of the town of Beth Zachariah. Confident that's, in his numbers. That's scary. You've got 20,000 men, and on top of that, you've got the low ground. Ooh, that is not a position I'd want to and be in. And expecting the Greeks to be wizened to his guerrilla warfare tactics by now, Judah opted to, for once, match the Seleucid army in a pitched battle. This was a dire mistake. The Jewish warriors were no match for the Macedonian phalanx in the open field, and on top of that, the war elephants were striking deep fear into the heart of Judah's troops. In an attempt to inspire bravery in his men, the younger brother of Judah, Eleazar Horan, charged right into the Seleucid front lines, diving under the lumbering legs of an approaching elephant and stabbing into its soft underbelly. The beast like was slain but its corpse fell onto Eleazar. Yeah, that's what I could have told you, bro. Probably a bad idea. Okay, probably a bad idea. You know what you do want to do with elephants? Is you want to bring in cavalry, because elephants are terrified of horses. Crushing the Hasmonean warrior in one of history's more spectacular deaths. Despite this brave sacrifice, the Maccabean forces were still routed and driven off the field. Lysias was- Yeah, if you guys ever, just hot tip, right? Everyday tip. If you ever encounter elephants and an elephant warfare, just bring some horses. 
Noguchi was not able to savor this victory for long. For in the following year, the hammer struck back, winning a minor victory over a Seleucid army at Edessa. This was not a crushing blow to the Seleucids, but once more Lysias had to return to Antioch to deal with his rivals. He was forced to compromise. Getting crushed by an elephant to own the lips? Oh my god. What if you deploy a giant Lego for the elephants to step on and did it? That, that, that's animal abuse, that's fucked up. With the Maccabees, repealing much of Antiochus IV's religious laws to placate his foe before retreating out of Judea. Taking advantage of this reprieve, Judah sent envoys to Rome. As they had a vested interest in keeping their Seleucid rivals weak, the Romans signed a treaty of mutual defense with the Maccabees in 161 BC, which legitimized Judah Maccabeus as a legitimate ruler of an independent Jewish state. Meanwhile, over in Antioch, didn't work out in the long term though. You know, the Romans were eventually when the Romans took over the area of Judea, they weren't very nice. They weren't very nice. The situation was growing volatile. King Demetrius I Soter rose to power following a political coup that saw the murder of boy King Antiochus V and his chief supporter Lysias. King Demetrius turned out to be more aggressive than his predecessors, and ignoring the Roman Judean treaty, he dispatched one of his top generals, Bacchides, at the head of 22,000 men to retake Judea. Bacchides managed to march right up to the gates of Jerusalem unopposed, catching Judah Maccabeus completely by surprise. He had only 3,000 men with him, and to make matters worse, most of them fled the city upon seeing how direly outnumbered they were. Yo, Left I with only a thousand well. or so men, the Hammer of Israel opted to go out in a blaze of glory, charging out into the field outnumbered twenty to one. Despite a valiant attempt, Judah and his men were overwhelmed and cut down to a man. Judah's brothers, Simeon and Jonathan, continued to fight on, eventually defeating so Bacchides and retaking Jerusalem in the years that followed. The brothers and their successors would continue to fight against the Seleucids for two more decades, <laughs> before the declining Israel Hellenistic Empire became mired in its own internal corruption and civil wars. In 141 BC, Judea came fully under the control of the Hasmonean dynasty, and the descendants of Judah Maccabeus and his brothers would rule it as a fully independent kingdom for a time. It is worth noting that even after this successful bid for independence, elements of the Hellenistic language and culture remained visible in Jewish society for centuries, especially after they were expelled from their homeland by the Romans after the Great Jewish Rebellion and forced to integrate as a diaspora community across a notoriously Greek-loving Roman Empire. The Maccabean Revolt has a somewhat mixed legacy. Were Judah and his followers brave freedom fighters, risking everything to preserve their culture and faith against an oppressive imperial regime? Or were they religious zealots, whose desire to force a rigidly theocratic society upon all Jewish peoples taints what could have been a noble legacy? Whatever the case, their impact on world history cannot be denied as each year millions of people light the eight candles that cut through the winter dark, and the story of the Hammer of Judea is echoed once more. Once again, thank- Yeah, that was an amazing video. That was top tier quality. I could never compete with that shit. Subscribing. Um, I will link to the original video so you guys can give it a like. You should give that a like, that was absolutely top tier quality right there. I, I love it when videos are not just like, one of my frustrating thing, one of the most frustrating things to me with history documentaries is how often you just see talking heads and maybe they'll show a painting here and there. I loved like the visual um, recreation of the actual battles, showing the strategy like that stuff. You know, that's my thing. I love that shit. Right. So that's the, the history of Hanukkah. Somehow a historical event based on religious zealotry and mass killings and war. Somehow that led to a. Uh, you know, a festival, a festival of light and tikkun alum and um, bringing light to the world and gifts. Hanukkah. And why do you love Hanukkah? I love Hanukkah because it really is about the light. 
and bringing light where there has been darkness. And there is so much work to be done. I in love the world watching this video after knowing the whole light. story. And it is a celebration of always Tikkun Alam, which is about <laughs> fighting for justice and, and fighting for the dignity of all and people. And killing all the Jews that have not supported like your religious version of Judaism, you know, all of that shit. So wholesome. So wholesome. Just tell them about anti-imperialism. The lefties will eat it up. Oh, yeah. Um, Hanukkah is about anti-imperialism. It was really a revolt against the imperialistic, Hellenistic colonizers. Honestly, I know this sounds really corny, but this is one of the best Hanukkahs I've ever had. I literally got to live like my dream of like when I first started to study history and um, go to university and stuff. It's like, Everyone makes the, the same fucking joke to you when you're a history major, right? And any history majors know this. They're like, oh, well, what are you going to do for your job? You know, I hear the being a historian is not really uh, in demand right now. Everyone always makes those jokes. And secretly, we all know that we're going to have to do something else. Like, I was planning on doing law or maybe you have to go, go do academia. Maybe you have to go teach high school. Like there's like a ton of things you do, but it's very rare that you get to do something within history itself. And the fact that like you guys made it possible for me to make my actual career on my biggest passion, which is history. It's every history major's dream. It's seriously so fucking cool. And I get a swear while I do it because I just think history is so much more interesting when I say fucking all the time. So like seriously, Thank you. Like, honestly, to each and every one of you, like, that is the best Hanukkah gift. I, I could never guess that la a Hanukkah last year that this, my, but my job would be, would be something where I get to use history. Like, that's crazy. And that's going to be my job. It's literally a fucking dream come true. It just is. So, like, honestly, thank you guys. Like, seriously, thank you. I think before we end the, the Hanukkah celebration, we move on. We should just do one more dance. No, I don't like that one. There, that's good. That's good.